Good afternoon and welcome back to FIRE by Black Press USA. The 12th president and chief executive officer of Meharry Medical College, Dr. James Hildreth, was born and raised in Camden, Arkansas. In 1975, he began undergraduate studies at Harvard University and was selected as the first African-American Rhodes Scholar from Arkansas in 1978. He graduated from Harvard Magna Cum Laude in chemistry in 1979. That fall, Dr. Hildreth enrolled at Oxford University in England, graduating with a PhD in immunology in 1982. And I probably said that wrong. At Oxford, he studied the biology of, and here's something else, cytotoxic T cells with Professor Andrew McMichael and became an expert in monoclonal antibody technology or tech technology <laughs> technology <laughs> and cell adhesion molecules. Recently, the Bloomberg Philanthropies gave $100 million to the four HBCU medical schools today to increase the number of Black doctors in the U.S. by reducing the debt burden of Black medical students. Mahari received the largest portion of that gift, $34 million, which is also the largest in the school's history. So what does that mean? for black doctors and medicine for black people overall. Well, we have one of the best in the world to talk about it. Again, the 12th president and CEO of Meharry Medical College. Welcome, Dr. James Hildred. Stacy, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be with you here today. Well, thank you. And um, I'm just not too happy of trying to pronounce these medical terms, um, you know. <laughs> but, but tell us, um, this gift from Bloomberg, it seems tremendous. Um, $34 million to Meharry. What does that mean uh, for, the, for the school? And what does that mean for the, the present and future of Black doctors? Well, Stacey, first of all, I'm so excited for our students who are going to benefit from this gift. Uh, our medical students graduate with a really high debt burden. It's far higher than the national average. I think our average medical student graduates owing $283,000, I'm sorry, yes, $283,000. And that has a lot of implications for them. For one thing, most of our students choose primary care specialties and they wanna go and work in underserved areas. And unfortunately, the compensation for doing that is probably the lowest in all of medicine. And so it makes it a difficult ch choice to make when you, when you, when you wanna do that and you have almost $300,000 of debt. So. Reducing their debt by $100,000 each is just a tremendous uh, thing to have happen for them, and I'm excited for them. But the implications is that by reducing the debt to such an extent, our students will have agency in terms of the choices they make. And the choices our students usually make is primary care and serving the underserved. So this is going to have implications for all the future communities they're going to serve when they go out and practice their, practice their craft. So, uh, the other thing I think the gift does is it validates the four black medical schools as being academic health sciences centers that happen to train a large number of African Americans. Uh, and I'm really, really happy that, Dr. that Mr. Bloomberg chose to do this for our schools because it's going to change the trajectory of our programs, change the future of our students. It, it just has implications that are, are far reaching and very exciting that, that he did that for us. Well, fantastic. Um, and, and let me say, too, as we start this uh, discussion, um, Dr. Hildreth, that generally when we have presidents of uh, historical black colleges and universities on, our, our own Dr. Nasinga Burton usually um, hold or, or conduct these interviews. So we're going to we're going to focus on on the gift and a couple of things today. But we're going to. Um, ask you to come back at some some point to sit with uh, Dr. Burton. I think you would enjoy that discussion. Sure. Um, sure. So in the meantime, I want to get back to it, though. So this um, this gift and, and as you as you articulated, obviously, what it means to to the students in the school. But what does more I want you to, to really bring home the point. What does more black doctors mean for uh, African-Americans? So, Stacey, the, the evidence is now quite compelling that, and definitive, I should say, that when black doctors take care of black people, generally speaking, the outcomes are better. One of the most dramatic examples of this was recently published showing that when black doctors take care of newborn babies, 
the results are much better and those babies are much more likely to survive than when white doctors take care of those newborn babies. That's not to say that white physicians don't provide great care to African Americans, because they do. But the point is that when there is a cultural connection between the provider and the patient, it just seems to engender a level of trust that manifests itself in better outcomes for those patients. And so black doctors, more black doctors would mean better outcomes probably overall for African Americans. Because really, to be honest, many African Americans prefer to go to see black doctors, but sometimes that's not possible. Because unfortunately, even though we're 13% of the population, we're just under 5% of all the black doctors in the country. So, and that, that's one of the reasons why this gift from Mike Bloomberg is important to increase that number because if we get more black doctors, we think the overall health of African Americans will be improved by, by that. And, and let me ask you this too, uh, Dr. Hilder, um, more black doctors, do you think that would translate into more blacks participating in clinical trials? We know how important they are. Stacey, I, I, I think so, because that point I made earlier about trust is one of the reasons why African-Americans do not necessarily gravitate to being participants in clinical studies, because if you don't see someone who looks like you sitting on the other side of that table, uh, taking the information for you and rolling you in the trial, again, the, the, the trust can get, the mistrust can get in the way of doing that. And to be sure, we have reasons to be weary with Tuskegee and Henry Lax and after we, actually all the way, going all the way back to 1619, to be honest. There are horror stories of what has been done to African American bodies in, uh, in, so, in, in the service of research, uh, if you want to call it that. So I'm not, I'm not minimizing the basis for the mistrust, but I do believe that if we had more African American physician scientists who are enrolling participants in studies, we'd have a better chance of getting there. And that's why I have made the decision that to the extent that it's possible, I'm going to participate in one of the vaccine trials to demonstrate that I have enough confidence in it to take it myself. And I want to make the point, uh, help me make the point of trying to convince people that they should do the same. But, yeah. but, but, but the trust issue cannot be overstated, that we've got to have more trusted messengers and more trusted opinion leaders in order to make this all work. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do, do at Meharry. Yeah, Dr. Hildreth, we, we have, um, as you know, the Black Press has uh, newspapers in just about every state and many uh, jurisdictions, many cities. Uh -huh. And and one of the papers near you, uh, the Tennessee Tribune, uh, the publisher, uh, Rosetta uh, Perry, right. Perry. Perry. I, I had a discussion with her uh, earlier this year and actually was led to a discussion with you and she, I said, you know, I, I guess he's one of the, the the top doctors in the country, and she says, no, the top doctor in the world. So, <laughs> <laughs> given that, given, given that, and given the situation of COVID nineteen, uh, I'd be remiss not to bring this up, and we we certainly can talk more about the gift, um, that great gift from Bloomberg in a moment. But school for many has started again, and it is starting again. Um, a lot of people have their, you know, anxieties, and understandably so. What's your thought on the reopening of school, and especially for the young ones? Stacy, I, I think my main concern, I will have a lot of concerns, but let me just share a couple of them with you. First of all, we, we've got to get the level of virus in the community at a low level to feel comfortable uh, starting schools and doing other things. And one of the national benchmarks, which I think is a pretty good one, you want to have the number of new cases below 10 per 100,000 people, because that means you only have one person in 10,000 becoming infected. And with that level of infection, you kind of feel safe, you know, letting, uh, letting things start up again. The other thing that I'm really concerned about, and I've, I've tw said this in many of my tweets uh, on Twitter, that ventilation cannot be under, uh, understated as a major concern because this is an airborne virus. And there was a study done at a hospital in Florida where they had COVID-19 patients in a room 
the room had the air exchanged six times per hour. That means that every 10 minutes, the air was completely refreshed in those rooms. The air was filtered through, through uh, submicron filters. There was a UV sterilization of the air as it went through. And despite all that, they were still able to detect infectious virus in the air in the rooms where those patients were. These patients were not coughing, they were not sneezing, they were simply in a room uh, in isolation in the hospital, and yet they were still able to. What the point I'm making is that if in a hospital room that has a state of the air air handling system, you still cannot completely eliminate the virus. How in the world could we imagine that in school buildings, which typically do not have even adequate, some of them, uh, HVAC system, that is going to be safe for large numbers of kids or, or people to be in a confined space and not have an outbreak? So I think that in some schools, we're just asking for trouble and we're creating the circumstances for what are called super spreader events because not enough attention is being paid to ventilation. And it may sound trivial, but it's of the utmost importance because this is an airborne virus and we got to acknowledge that. And if we're going to keep people safe, that needs to be factored in. So if resources are made available to upgrade the air handling systems in our schools, and the community level of virus is low, then I would feel comfortable sending my child to, to somebody's classroom. Well, and it's interesting, Dr. Hildreth, we, again, we're talking with Dr. James Hildreth, the 12th president of Meharry Medical uh, College in Tennessee. Um, it's interesting you mentioned that the virus uh, being um, airborne, um, we don't hear a lot about that. And back in April, and I believe it was following the discussion with you and some other um, top uh, doctors that the uh, National Newspaper Publishers Association's Coronavirus Task Force, led by Dr. Ben Chavis, our uh, president and CEO, um, broke a story that it was airborne and he declared for Black America, in particular, a state of emergency. Um, we, we see schools going back as we're talking about the schools again. Um, can you comment on the fact that universities seem to be sending their students back home shortly after welcoming them, welcome them to campus? And what's the experience at Meharry? So uh, first at Meharry, we are back underway with our students in a, in a sort of a, a combination of virtual and in, in person. Keep in mind that when you're training dental students and medical students, part of their training obligates them to be in close contact with patients. And so we're taking steps in both cases to make sure that, that can be done with the appropriate PPE. But otherwise, all of the learning that's happening right now is virtual. That is to say, we're using the, the web, web-based learning tools and teaching tools, because we don't feel like it's safe yet to bring students back uh, to class. We have, for example, in the, in the dental school, there are 62 students per class. In the medical school, there are 120 students per class. We don't think it's safe yet to have them back in a in a lecture hall setting where they are in close proximity to each other. So, for all of our didactic uh, teaching at the moment, that's being done virtually, and for our medical and dental students who are back in the clinics, we're taking all the necessary steps with protective equipment and adequate ventilation, and in some cases, we're trying to prevent aspirations or aerosols with the proper equipment. So. We're, we're a combination of, of in-person when we have to be, because there's no other choice, with some precautions. Otherwise, all of it's virtual. Uh, it's not surprising to me that <laughs> some of the big universities that open their doors within a short time have to send kids back again, because <laughs> it's hard to control what people at that age are doing and Stacy, there's still the, the issue that young people, especially that age group, believe that this is not a problem for them. So they don't need to necessarily do the things that everyone else is doing to protect themselves. And that is a, a fallacy because we now know that a couple of things. There are cases of people in their early 20s getting really sick, sick almost to the point of dying. And you know, the, these kids, some of them are going back to their home their families on a regular basis. So even if they don't get sick, they can take the virus back to their families and there might be someone in their family who, who would not do so well with this. So it's not a surprise to me 
that some of the major universities that started in class uh, uh, sessions again found themselves sending the kids back home because it's hard to control the behavior at that age. And you know, there's a there's an exuberance about being back together again, having seen each other for a few months. And so there's a lot of partying and otherwise going on. And those are the perfect circumstances to create super spreader events. And so it's not a surprise to me and to many others that uh, they had to reverse course. It was predicted and predictable that that would happen. And that's exactly what we saw. And Dr. Hildreth, can you comment to, uh, speaking of super spreader events, there are some who uh, are a growing number who believe and they have what they call COVID parties. Let's just get it and get it over with. Um, there's a belief that once you get it, you can't get it again, which seems to have been debunked too. But can you talk about yeah. that? Uh, Stacey, you, you, you are correct. The, I was horrified when I read about these so-called COVID parties where groups of people get together hoping that one of them can give the virus to all the others. And I guess the idea was that if I get infected and I recover, I'll have some immunity and I'm, I'll be okay. Well, we don't, we're not sure yet that that is true. In fact, we now know that you can get reinfected. And in some cases, people get sick again. In other cases, they don't. But what that actually says is that the, the immunity you get from being infected may be not strong enough to protect you or is not long lasting. Either way, it appears that the, the, the idea that I'm gonna get immunity by getting infected might be a false hope. And we gotta do more research to actually know whether or not uh, infection results in immunity. And it may well be that depending on your age, it will, and you know, again, it may not. We know, for example, that in children, they get reinfected by coronaviruses all the time. And by the way, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 disease, is a member of a large group of family of, of viruses. The coronavirus family has like 39, at least 39 members. And six of those viruses are human coronaviruses. And three of them are responsible for common colds. And they've been infecting humans since the early 60s, as far as we know. And we know for sure that children can get infected by coronaviruses over and over again. And that might mean that the immune response in children is not adequate for protection. But the point is, we know from children that some coronaviruses, at least, can repeatedly infect the same person over and over again. And thankfully, these are viruses that just cause common colds and don't cause severe disease. But, but I think the idea that I'm going to get infected and get, get protective immunity is not something we should all count on. And yeah, and the, re the research oh, is on the way to prove it, but for now, it's an open question. Yeah, and, and Dr. Um, Hildreth, can you talk about, even to those who have had COVID and have recovered, can you talk about some of the, the potential ramifications of, of the disease after you have recovered? Right. Uh, so Stacy, for, you know, this is the third pandemic caused by a coronavirus in this century. In 2003, it was SARS. 2012, it was MERS, middle, middle, Mediterranean uh, Respiratory Syndrome. And in both of those cases, we know, in medicine, we call them long-term sequelae. That is the long-term consequences of having a disease. Will that, would it have effects on your body for a long time? And in SARS and MERS, we know that there were people who could not go back to work for as long as two years because they had such a difficult time breathing and they had this, this real, really weird uh, uh, tiredness where they just were lethargic, they had confusion. That lasted for months and months. We're starting to see evidence that for COVID-19, the same thing is true, that people are having a difficult time breathing. Some of them are, are having confusion episodes. And we know that this is happening. We don't know the extent that it's happening, but I would predict that for a significant percent of people who get COVID-19, especially those who have a severe disease and recover, they might expect to have some consequences for many months to come after they recover, and they may not be able to, to work or function totally as they did beforehand. Mm -hmm. And Stacey, one of my biggest concerns about children is we don't know that just because children do not get really sick, 
that when they get infected, there won't be some of these long-term consequences for them because their bodies are still developing. There are systems that are being fine-tuned in terms of muscles, bones, etc. And we don't know whether or not an infection by a virus like this is going to cause some disruption in those normal growing and patterning processes that need to happen. So my advice to everybody is that if you can avoid getting infected, you should, because we can't predict what it's going to do to you over the long term. Yeah, Dr. James Hildreth, uh, president of Meharry Medical College. Uh, Annette Phillips, I just want to acknowledge those who are, uh, some of those who are watching Annette Phillips and David Youngblood, um, Shamira Edmonds, uh, thanks for joining us. Nicole McDaniel has a question and she says, she was just talking about immunity and reinfection earlier today. Sounds more and more like the only relief from COVID will be the vaccine, but what are the risks with that? Um, well, I believe that the only way we're going to get out of this and get to a new normal or to something that looks like the old normal is a vaccine. And I can share with you, with the listeners and those who are watching that there's been an unprecedented response to this problem by the scientific community around the globe. Uh, scientists who are working on other things, other viruses, sort of pause their other work to focus on this. So the good news is that every possible type of vaccine you can imagine is being explored by some lab somewhere. And right now there are at least 20, maybe as many as 30 vaccines that are in human studies around the world. Uh, and because the COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, does not mutate as much as we thought it might, that means that a vaccine can probably be made that will work. Uh, the usual risk of vaccines are the risk of getting an injection in your arm, which can be some soreness that might last for a few days. But you need to understand that the whole purpose of the vaccine is, get the, is to get the attention of your immune system. And when your immune system is working, a few things happen usually. One is you get a fever because the immune cells, when they respond to antigens or to challenges, they release small chemicals that cause fever to occur. So in a lot of people who get a vaccine injection, fever is a common uh, occurrence. The other one is headache, that there can be a mild headache that might persist for a few days. And then there's the soreness that's going to happen where you've been injected. Uh, and depending on what kind of vaccine that is used, some vaccines are actually viruses that have been weakened to, to get the immune system attention but not cause disease. And in some people, you can get a flu-like syndrome after getting the vaccine. But as far as I know, none of the vaccines for COVID-19 involve attenuated viruses. There may be some that I'm not aware of, but most of the vaccines that are being developed for this virus are called subunit vaccines, where a small part of the virus, a protein from the virus, is encapsulated or formulated, injected into the body, your immune system responds to it. You generate memory cells, and the next time you see the virus, your immune system remembers the challenge. It responds quickly, and you get protected. So the main uh, risk of the vaccines are the ones I've enumerated. But people with certain allergies, you can't give them certain types of vaccines because there are chemicals in them that might trigger uh, an allergic reaction. And when you get signed up for vaccine studies, they'll ask you questions about your, your allergy history, the medicines you're taking, just to make sure that the vaccine you're going to be getting is compatible with the allergies you have and with your, some medical conditions. So yeah. vaccines are, are really safe. Yeah. So generally, join the um, our FIRE program here, uh, Black Press USA. Uh, we have some very sophisticated uh, viewers. And I just I know we only have a few moments left, but I'm going to give you three questions that David Youngblood, Janice Sherwood and Shama Shamira Edmonds has posed. And I'll start with David. I'll just run it down. He says, would you take the vaccine currently being promised for October 30th by President Trump? Janice uh, Sherwood says, does zinc help and elderberry? And Shamira Edmonds says, what risks or long-term long effects would the vaccine have on people with compromised immune systems from cancer? So the, the answer to the first question is absolutely not. 
there's no way that by November 1st, any of the vaccines that are currently being studied could be proven to be safe and effective. The phase three trials, the last phase, well, the next to last phase and the largest by far, where you got tens of thousands of people being enrolled. Harry is part of these studies, by the way. We're enrolling people for one of the phase three studies. We've only just begun starting enrolling people into the phase three, right? And we got to get 10,000 people per vaccine. So the prospect of enrolling 10,000 people, 30,000 people actually, uh, watching them long enough to see who gets infected and who doesn't, that just cannot happen in two months. We got September and October, that cannot happen in two months. And so as far as I'm concerned, any promise of a vaccine by November 1st should be should be summarily dismissed. And uh, I would certainly not take a vaccine that came aligned on November 1st. And furthermore, I'm going to be, I've been appointed to the FDA commission that will approve the vaccines. And there's no way I'm voting <laughs> to approve a vaccine that has not met all the safety criteria. The second question was about zinc and elderberry. Elderberry, yes. 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 Zinc is a, is a trace element that's absolutely essential to the function of your immune system. And that's why me at age 63 for the last 40 years, I've been taking a multivitamin every day so that I can make sure that zinc, selenium, and manganese and a few other things are in my body. I eat a pretty reasonable, nutritious uh, diet, but some of those trace elements are not sufficient necessarily in the diets we eat. So I take a multivitamin every day to make sure that those trace elements are present. I don't have enough information about elderberry to make any comment about it, but I can tell you that most of the plant-based uh, adjuvants that we use or, or food substances that we use, they don't do any harm, but the evidence that they benefit us for a lot of them, it's, it's, not, it's not really there. The last question was about the compromised immune system and cancer. If you have a compromised immune system, it is not likely that you're going to be allowed to participate in a vaccine study because it, the vaccine itself, if you have any a compromised immune system, might do you harm. And there's also a, there are certain cancers, I think, that if you have them, for the same reason, you're not likely to be allowed to participate because some cancers in and of themselves compromise the immune system. And that might make it not so safe to be participating in a vaccine study. And some of the vaccines might in fact interfere with your cancer therapies. So compromise the immune system and certain types of cancer, it would not be advisable to participate in a vaccine trial. Wow, so, so you've heard, You've heard it first right here on Black Press USA, Dr. Um, James Hill just says about President Trump's uh, November 1st vaccine. He says, no, absolutely no, not. Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely. Well, and, and Nicole McDaniel says, thanks for the detailed response. And I know all of our viewers feel the same way. We really appreciate that. And before we let you go, um, Dr. Hildreth, I want to go back to the importance of, of that um, Bloomberg Philanthropy's uh, $34 million gift. Um, when you get gifts like this, and let's, let's be specific about this, when will when exactly will the, your school uh, start to see the benefits of this? And when will, when will the public at large see the benefits of Meharry's gift from um, Bloomberg? Well, they see the students will see the benefit almost right away. We have to have a couple of weeks to work out the logistics of it. But here's what's happening. Every one of our medical students that qualifies in terms of financial need will have their debt reduced by up to $100,000. So if you were gonna graduate owing $200,000, the Bloomberg gift is now cutting your debt in half, which again, gives our students agency to make choices that are gonna affect the communities that they go out to serve. I also think this gift will inspire others to make similar gifts, because we have dental students, by the way, who have even more debt than the medical students. So we're trying to find a donor to help our dental students out. But I also hope it's gonna inspire young people who are thinking about being a doctor, but are worried about the financial challenges of doing this. A gift like this may say to those students that, hey, there's someone out there who might help me do this, and they'll decide to pursue that dream 
uh, despite the financial challenges. So I think the gift has lots of ramifications, but the bottom line is that our students will start to benefit from it right away. Well, Dr. James uh, Hildreth of Meharry Medical College, we sincerely thank you for joining us today on FIRE. Uh, tonight at seven o'clock, um, I mean, we've all uh, heard the cry, Black Lives Matter. We've, we've all heard, we've all witnessed through video, the shootings of um, various unarmed African-Americans by law enforcement. Well, tonight um, we talk with the mother of Philando Castile at mm. 7 p.m. live here um, to discuss that case and to discuss others just like it. And we've seen so much of it. So see, see us tonight, join us tonight at seven o'clock. And again, um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hildreth for joining us. We really appreciate you so much. And everybody stay safe and stay well. We'll see you tonight. Thank you, Stacey.